Our next presenter is with that well-known organization, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. They're uh, based in Frederick, Maryland, and they represent 415,000 pilots out of the 600,000. Two-thirds of the pilots in this country are represented by AOPA, your loudest voice in general aviation. Our next presenter is the chief flight instructor for the Air Safety Foundation. He has over 13,000 hours of flying. He's a retired American Airlines captain, uh, a Czech airman for the company on uh, 767s, and he says now that he's retired, he has stepped up to a Cessna 172 for pleasure flying. His topic today is the top five mistakes that we make as pilots. Let's welcome Mr. J.J. Greenway. Thank you very much, Walt. Appreciate you all coming into the tent. I know all the years I've been in Sun and Fun, it's never hard to fill this tent at 11.30 in the morning and at 1 in the afternoon in this building because it's a place to sit down and it's a place where there's some nice air conditioning. So uh, I know you'd be here anywhere, anyway, even if I wasn't here. Do we have any uh, non-flying spouses that have accompanied anyone to Sun and Fun this year? One or two out there. Um, my wife didn't come with me this year. She's only been here once and uh, she's not a big air show person. She likes to fly with me, but uh, walking around in the sun and the dust for four or five days, just not her cup of tea. So a couple of years ago, a good friend of mine, Tom, called up and said, hey, I want you and your wife to go to the air show. I'll fly you down. And I said, oh, my wife doesn't go. He says, well, you got to see my airplane. I just got it. Uh, it's got a lavatory on board and food and everything. So he flew us down here. That's us on our way down the last time she was here. And uh, this is how I had anticipated bringing her down this time. Uh, <laughs> so you take your pick, that one or, or this one. So this is more fun, I think. But uh, she did have a fun time coming down that first time, but I haven't been able to convince her to come down since. At any rate, um, at the Air Safety Foundation, we are very data-driven. We look at every single accident that happens. We take the general aviation accidents, and since that's what we're familiar with and that's what we want to focus on, and we look at the causes. We throw out uh, helicopters. We don't uh, study those accidents. We throw out commercial accidents. We look at the, just the type of flying that you and I are used to doing in the daily course of our general aviation. We're all interested in air safety. It's hard to compare apples with oranges, and a lot of statistics do but we have to drive in and see with automobiles we know that with the accident death rate is about 40,000 uh, per year with motorcycles there's about 4,500 deaths per year vending machines <clears throat> I don't think there's a uh, vending machine safety foundation but you can look these statistics up I did and found out that since 1978 40 people have been killed and a lot more have been injured trying to get free product out of a vending machine and the <laughs> machines tipped over on them not a good idea Flying is as safe as we want to make it, though. It really is. Um, if you've been to any of the maintenance seminars, I was sitting in one just earlier. We talk about uh, mandatory service bulletins. We talk about ADs. And there's so many things that we can do to make flying safer. Right now, we're running in, in general aviation about 500 deaths per year um, in light plane crashes. The airlines have an obviously enviable safety record. And they went a couple of years with zero deaths. I don't think we'll ever get there in general aviation, but I think there's a lot that we can do as pilots to narrow down the accident rate right now and narrow down the fatality rate. Uh, so it's something that we're all a little bit more comfortable. As you know, the Air Safety Foundation, our main product that we put out every year is the NAL report. And I brought exactly 106 pounds of NAL reports down here with me because I just signed the air bill for them. And they're in the back if you want to take one on the way out. And that's where we have our data that we've gone through and sifted through to see exactly what our uh, statistics are and where the top areas are where we get in trouble as pilots. We're going to look at those and what I've done is we've taken a five-year average because there's little spikes once in a while. We've taken a five-year average of the accidents because we didn't want to have this seminar uh, go stale on us after just one year. But it's all human nature that connects these accidents. In the NAL report that figures 79 percent. There's just right around 20 percent of accidents are mechanically caused and the rest of them are caused right up here by the pilot and as we go through this program you'll see a couple of the things that uh, we do as pilots that uh, are just plain not smart got to get there you're on your way to sun and fun you're weathered in for four or five days somewhere that's obviously pressure and you know one thing with uh, student pilots as a flight instructor we have any CFIs in here by the way a couple of CFIs in here as a flight instructor 
we're teaching something now uh, called aeronautical decision making that we didn't used to teach in the 60s and 70s when a lot of us were learning to fly. And that is, don't set yourself up the pressure. Don't have an appointment on the other end that you have to get to that's going to make you uh, feel pressured to make a decision that's not going to end up to be a wise decision at the end. Accidents always happen to the other guy. Uh, if you were like me and you learned to fly when you were uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, you know how teenagers have that feeling of invincibility. Nothing can happen to them. It's always something to the other guy. And there's lots of other guys. The number one accident. Maneuvering flight. It's not a very uh, imaginative uh, name, but that's what we get from the NTSB records. And with all the uh, litigation out, I'm surprised that when we come into an air show like this, we don't see a sign that says, caution, the Surgeon General has determined that acting out air show pilot fantasies may lead to personal death or injury. <clears throat> the people that you hear right now out in the background are highly trained professionals, as you know. And uh, some of you may be uh, the same thing as well in this room. I'm not. Uh, and we do have to resist an impulse to uh, do some things that our airplane is not stressed to do. Maneuvering flight is uh, not just what you think. It's not just the uh, high profile accidents that you read about. It also is um, pipeline patrol, formation flight. Um, if you're out in the mountain west, canyon flying. Let's take a look in the traffic pattern. Um, we have controlled flight into terrain, flying low, uh, people buzzing, they hit things that aren't necessarily uh, charted. Most of the high things are charted, but you notice on, there's a little disclaimer that they started putting in the 80s on the sectional chart that not every single thing that's an obstruction is charted. And we have stall spin accidents or uncontrolled flight into terrain. Some things that uh, can pop up when we're operating the airplane in a regime of flight that we're not normally used to operating it in. And we have what we call stupid pilot tricks. <laughs> the audio is not uh, up on this, and we have some good audio to go with it. And I'm sorry you're not hearing it. But we had uh, this happen, and this guy actually uh, this guy actually lived through this, and that was uh, actual footage. But uh, an air show announcer, you notice how the air show announcers here are safely ensconced in the upstairs of this building here. Uh, before they had F FAA laws about doing these things, we uh, didn't have it quite so well, and things like this happened once in a while. I like to quote my boss on this one, Bruce Landsberg. If you heard him speak yesterday, it was one of his favorite ones. Sufficiently poor judgment can overcome even great skill. <laughs> we have a couple accidents like this that happen every year. Uh, 300 series BMW, it looks like, is a pretty fair match for a Piper Aero 4 T-tail with a gear problem. And uh, you can see that the margin for safety in a case like this has been uh, severely reduced. And if we had audio on this, you'd hear the... Uh, Residents are also upset over reports the pilot of the plane may have been doing aerial acrobatics just the before the... The emotional response to this crash is that neighbor after neighbor reported to KCRA 3 that they saw this plane, owned by Patrick O'Brien, doing low-flying aerobatic stunts over Roseville, not only just right before this crash, but also a day earlier on Saturday. He was flying pretty low. He was only about 300 feet above the houses. Uh, and when he took vertical here, he was only about maybe 800 feet. So when he, when he, he stalled, there was no time for him to recover. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you may remember this accident that happened. It was a very tragic accident. And it was not a one-time thing that this pilot was doing. He had a uh, regular routine that he liked to perform out over his neighborhood. And uh, it didn't just end up bad for him and his passenger. It ended up real bad for the, uh, the occupant of the house as well. Uh, these things get a little bit out of hand. I guess you could say that there might be a time and a place for buzzing. Uh, I would question the legality of it, but it certainly isn't over a populated neighborhood in, uh, in uh, a high-density area in Northern California. We all know that uh, the relationship between stall speed and angle of attack, and we remember that favorite chart that we have in the Cessna manual if you're trained in a Cessna, about the steeper the bank and, and the relationship of the stall speed. When we are buzzing or doing something that we're a little bit outside of our range of familiarity in an airplane, uh, we tend to handle the airplane a little aggressively because it's a maneuver that we're not used to performing. And in VS, our stall speed, of course, increases with the wing loading. That's something that uh, comes as a surprise to us if the last time we practiced stalls was 30 years ago in, uh, in, in flight training. If you're low, you have no hope of recovery, really. But 
if you do have to buzz, and I don't recommend it, be aware of it. obstructions. Um, and the older I get, I find that the slower I taxi because my brain can't keep up with my, my taxi speed. Uh, I, myself, don't consider myself a good enough pilot to, uh, to even attempt half the things that these guys are doing out here, guys and gals are doing out here on the flight line. Uh, that's why I have the best respect for them. Um, accelerated stall spin and uh, structural failure is about the worst that can happen uh, when we're performing maneuvers that are outside the range of our airplanes. Another common one is a base to, turn, base to final turn. Uh, while operating in the traffic pattern. The tendency is to overshoot, particularly with the wind that you haven't corrected for, and to correct that overshoot, how tempting is it to sneak in a little bit of bottom rudder on that turn? Then you've got an airplane that's uncoordinated, low to the ground, and stalling at a speed, since you're in a turn and angle of attack is greater, stalling at a speed that's higher than you're used to stalling. Bad news for something like that. But a few things we can do to protect it, just some rules of thumb or some personal minimums you can set for yourself. Try to stay above 1,000 feet AGL. And if you do feel like you're uh, engaging in aerobatics and your G suit is inflated, or at least you feel some Gs, think about what you're doing. If you need more than a 30 degree bank in the pattern, it might be a good time to think about either widening out your pattern or going around from your pr present position. The number two pilot killer. Accidents that happen on the descent and approach. Warning, a fragile aircraft. Do not use to clear trees or brush. Do not use as an excavating tool. <laughs> to reduce the risk of serious injury, do not attempt to disobey laws of physics. Taunt mother nature, and important, children under 16 must have adult supervision, at least for uh, powered airplanes. We uh, get a lot of uh, weather-related accidents in this category. Uh, and a lot of them are for instrument rated pilots. How many instrument ratings do we have in here? Just get a show of hands to see we're about 50-50, maybe 70-30. Um, the non-precision approach. And fortunately with the advent of WAS, I attended a WAS seminar just a little bit earlier and I was amazed that uh, LPV or vertical guidance approaches are about to outnumber ILS approaches in this country. So they're popping up at an amazing rate. That's good for us if we're flying IFR. But the non-precision approach as we know it now, uh, particularly a VOR alpha approach, and we don't have a lot of NDB approaches, or an approach that is just to the airport, not to a specific runway, often the missed approach point is at a point over the airport from which at the minimum descent altitude you really can't make a normal landing. So that's why they have circling minimums only for a VOR alpha approach. Uh, my approach at my home airport has a minimum descent altitude of about 600 feet above the ground and the approach ends right over the middle of the airport. Uh, I don't need to tell uh, anyone that's a pilot that from 600 feet right over the middle of the airport you really can't land on any runway uh, so at that point you have to circle. A circling approach, of course, the minimums are low but notice on your, on your uh, downwind legs when you're VFR you're usually at about 1,800 to 1,000 AGL. Circling approach, all of a sudden you're in the neighborhood of having to make a downwind base leg uh, at between altitudes all the way down to 300 to 400 feet AGL. That's something that we don't practice every day when we have to do it for the first time if we're in low visibility conditions. It can be uh, a little dicey at best. Do we have any, anybody with a, a wide body jet type rating in here? I notice a lot of the, the new ones, they say circling approach is restricted to VMC, visual meteorological conditions only. So with all the training that, uh, that a 777 captain gets, they still can't make a circling approach with uh, minimums of less than 1,000 foot ceilings and three miles visibility. The FAA agrees with that, the insurance companies agree with that, and that's the way it's been for quite some time. More frequent uh, proficiency checks. Um, we recommend the Air Safety Foundation that you actually get a proficiency check once every six months. Whether you've stayed current by uh, meeting the requirements of Part 61, or whether you've just gotten your instrument rating, but um, currency checks that focus on what you do. And uh, single pilot IFR, SPIFR focus. If you fly in a crew all the time, and I must confess that, that probably the majority, although I fly a lot of single engine IFR, probably the majority of time in my logbook, uh, instrument time is logged with a crew, and I'm used to flying with a crew. And as an instrument instructor, I resist the impulse to, to help that student out so much uh, because I've gotten the crew mentality. But if you fly single pilot IFR, make sure you're flying with a, an instructor on your um, IPC that is going to make you do everything, that's going to let you make a mistake, that's going to 
uh, watch while you forget to reset uh, VOR OBS for the outbound course when you cross the VOR. Focus on the single pilot IFR things because there's so many things to do that uh, if you are used to having someone help you out and all of a sudden you're doing it by yourself for the first time, uh, it can have some interesting results at best. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, ex uh, expecting a different result. And I sometimes wonder when I see these accidents, I saw one a couple of years ago where the pilot had made seven approaches and crashed on, on the eighth approach. And uh, you really have to ask yourself, if you've made two approaches, has anything changed on the surface with the conditions before you make that third approach? If you're just rolling the dice and, and making multiple approaches trying to get an IFR, uh, on the basis of the fact that you might get lucky, uh, you've entered an area where our statistics show that after that second approach, your chances for having uh, an untimely end on your third approach get pretty high, a little higher odds than I wish to take. We have some things product at the Air Safety Foundation online, and these are available to members and non-members alike. Since we're donor supported, the Air Safety Foundation uh, product is free to anyone with a uh, computer. We recommend high speed, but we have the IFR chart challenges. And what we do is we sort through and we get some of the more complicated uh, approach charts and we look at some accidents that have happened in that area and we take some mistakes that people have made and we build it into scenar a scenario that you can go through and uh, complete the course and no one else knows if you get anything wrong. I can't see the results up at AOPA headquarters and uh, you can get a certificate of completion when you go through the course. But some of these things really stretch me out. Uh, I get the first copy across my desk and uh, I will tell you that I have about a 70 to 80 percent pass rate on these because uh, there are questions that are asked that are uh, easy to trip people up even if they've been flying a lot of IFR. Let's move on to number three pilot killer. Anyone want to take a guess at what this is? See what it is. Accidents that happen in the takeoff and climb. <clears throat> this is a noise abatement sign uh, at a local airport near us. Notice for noise abatement, climb straight ahead to 13, uh, 1300 feet MSL, preferably without crashing. That's loud. <clears throat> I think one of our uh, developers photoshopped that sign a little bit, but uh, you get the basic point on that. You think of, uh, of takeoff accidents uh, as being a no-brainer. How could anyone get in trouble on, an a on a takeoff? Uh, push the throttle in and uh, keep the airplane going straight down the surface that you're on, whether it be a lake, runway, or a field, and off you go in the air. Other inherent issues, though, that pop up, you're operating the airplane at a very high AOA, low airspeed, high engine stress, and with high engine stress, um, one thing up in the northerly latitudes where we are in the wintertime, your engine may be real cold and it may be not operating at, uh, at optimum temperature, so you may have some problems for there. Um, Left turning tendencies, I didn't see that in there until I first had delivered this seminar a couple of times. I didn't change it, but if any of you have flown a British built airplane, I have a little bit of time in an Auster, and it has a right turning tendency, so left rudder on takeoff, but you get the idea. Um, need to keep the airplane going straight down the line. And as you accelerate, your control forces are always changing. So a lot of takeoff accidents uh, are don't make it into the NTSB records because they're uh, runway excursions where the airplane's maybe not damaged enough to warrant an NTSB report, but these things are all out there waiting to grab us. If we do have a mechanical failure, that uh, 15 to 20 percent of accidents that are mechanical failures, there's a lot we can do as pilots to uh, right away mitigate the situation. Uh, get the nose over right away, and this is more important in uh, I see some of these steermen out here, and if you've ever flown the steermen, you notice that, that uh, if the engine does quit, you really need to unload that elevator right away and get the nose way down, uh, particularly if you're low, if you want to maintain any kind of flying speed. Now, in my Cessna 172 that Walt was saying I stepped up to, it's, uh, it's not quite so critical, but still, nonetheless, uh, you want to look at something soft and inexpensive straight ahead of you to hit, uh, rather than uh, stall spin, as happens in a lot of cases or uh, try to turn around and, and not make it all the way around back to the airport. Good idea to know the altitude at which you can successfully turn around at the weight that you're operating in your airplane. Other things that, we, that pop up as pilots, maybe an improper pre-flight. Um, we left a control lock in or a door pops open. Um, 
I saw a Cirrus the other day taking off, and uh, he aborted his takeoff, and I had already pulled onto the runway. I probably was a little quick, but uh, he sheepishly admitted that his door had popped open, and uh, he turned off the runway and taxied back. Happens uh, with alarming regularity. But the thing is to fly the airplane first and not to let that distraction catch up with you. We'll talk about density, altitude, uh, weight and balance in a minute, but one thing that, that we've noticed that uh, pops up a lot in these uh, takeoff accidents is uh, improperly computed runway length. And you remember as you're taking your private pilot knowledge test particularly, going into those charts and parsing down uh, takeoff distances and takeoff distances over a 50-foot obstacle. And when you take the knowledge test, sometimes the questions are, is it 1,812 feet or 1,846 feet? Well, don't be led down uh, into thinking that you're actually getting that kind of takeoff performance. Uh, add a little bit to it. An 1,800-foot runway is a, is a very short runway, but the book may say that you're able to do it in a lot less than 1,800 feet. But if you pad yourself with a 50% takeoff distance in addition to what the book says you need, you're going to end up a lot happier uh, for your daily operations. One way that the Part 121 airlines get around this is they add either 40% or 60% to take off and landing distances depending on the situation. So they are required to build a fudge factor in and uh, the airline safety record, uh, knock on wood, has been very good. Except for a few little maintenance issues lately. <coughs> I, uh, another gentleman back here has an airplane that's probably close to a year that mine is. You said you had a 172 with 150 horse. Is it a, what model is it? N or P? 160? Okay. Um, my airplane's about 34 years old and uh, it hasn't had the major overhaul yet because it's got real low time. So I'm pretty sure I'm not developing 150 horsepower. And if I'm not, my performance book is really out the window. So something to think about as we're uh, looking at older airplanes, uh, airplanes that have been used and abused and might not be making it all the way up to their full capability. Density altitude. I spent a little uh, time flying, observing with uh, the Mission Aviation Fellowship pilots down in Indonesia not too long ago. They were flying Cessna caravans into some high mountain strips around 5,000, 5,400 feet. And you know what impressed me the most? And these guys are operating a long ways away from civilization. We had to get up real early one morning and, and fly. About 4 o'clock we left, and I said, we've got all day to do this. What's, uh, what's the problem? He said, well, we have to be in and out by 10 a.m. Otherwise, we're spending the night in the Garoka Highlands. And he said, you don't want to spend the night up there. So I saw what he meant when the commit point on the approach was about 1,200 AGL, and after that, there was no go around. So I helped unload, and we were out of there by 10 a.m., but they were very, very serious about that. Not even an airline. They're uh, a very professional group of missionary aviators. But it's a lesson for me that if we set personal minimums for ourselves like that, we can increase our safety so much. And now as summer's coming and the, uh, the backcountry airports open up, uh, particularly in the Mountain West, there's a lot of strips. I'm just picking on Idaho, uh, for instance, since I've probably flown the most GA there. There's a lot of strips that you really ought to be in and out of there by 8 or 9 a.m. and that you really ought not be going there if you don't have a headwind to help you get out or a headwind to help you land. Uh, just because we're here in Lakeland, Florida doesn't mean we don't suffer from density altitude problems. Check those charts. One good thing about the AWOS, and this is one reason why I don't mind paying federal taxes so much, uh, the AWOS um, in most cases and the ASOS lists your density altitude. And that's uh, very handy because the E6B whiz wheel here I'm sure you all have one in your flight bag right now and uh, know how to use it. And remember how to use it? I just recently found my E6B the other day. I've had it since I was 15 years old, and I, I hadn't seen it for a long time. And I will confess that uh, I did find the book with it, too, and, uh, and had to get back into the book to figure out how to use it. But understand density altitude. Understand the effects of density altitude on your airplane. Understand that it can happen at low altitude as well. Wind control is another thing affecting takeoff. And when we're operating in an airport uh, with a lot of buildings near the runway, that is really its own microclimatology. And we have, we can't see the wind, but if you see the buildings near the runway, you can see the effect of the wind pretty easily. Really impressed me last night, uh, the, the night air show. Uh, being a very, very amateur aerobatic pilot myself, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time looking out at the horizon, but I can't imagine how these guys are doing these maneuvers with very, very little horizon last night. Did anyone catch that air show last night? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, but uh, I, I can't imagine uh, trying to see where you are at the top of a roll with a very limited horizon. 
Same thing just for our normal operations in our general aviation aircraft though, particularly around the ocean, uh, beachfront airports. If you're taking off, off over the water, you really need to plan on making a zero-zero takeoff and be on the gauges from rotation on. Um, accident happened just recently in, uh, I believe it was Venice. Uh, the probable cause is not out yet, so I'm not speculating, but it was pretty suspicious on a, on a very dark, moonless, and cloudy night with a high overcast. Uh, the airplane ended up in the water within 70 seconds after takeoff. Need to be ready to go on the gauges right away. And the number four with almost 15% of all fatal pilot related accidents. Weather. Caution here, natural forces may impose stress loads in excess of aircraft structural limitations. Problem is what, with weather accidents, as we're seeing them now, they, they come in, is that they're the high probability of fatality. With takeoff and landing, we're down near the ground. Uh, but with weather accidents, these often occur at cruise altitudes. And one interesting thing we've noticed in the statistics, um, with more and more traveling airplanes uh, coming on the market, uh, high-end singles particularly, we're seeing those airplanes involved in a disproportionately high number of weather accidents because they're encountering weather en route. And that's something that we didn't envision happening, a spike there. But it stands to reason that if you're taking an airplane uh, that's a traveling machine versus a J3 Cub, which is not a traveling machine, you're going to have more weather accidents uh, in a high-end single than you are in some, a training aircraft or, or something that's just being used for local flights around the airport. Nearly all fatal. What is the problem with the weather? Mostly thunderstorms, and if anyone, uh, any of you saw my boss's presentation uh, yesterday on thunderstorms, he did a couple of them for the last couple of days, Bruce Landsberg, uh, and he was flying home this morning. I saw him in the hotel lobby and he was shaking his head because there was a couple of good thunderstorms between here and Frederick, Maryland. So <laughs> I said, uh, remember what you were talking about yesterday. Thunderstorms we have, and VFR and IMC is another real common one, uh, and this affects instrument pilots uh, almost as much as it affects VFR pilots because they're not on an instrument flight plan and they're not at a place where they can legally or safely fly instruments. So VFR and IMC seems to be a pretty, a pretty equal killer. Uh, and then we have icing accidents. We're having about a dozen fatal icing accidents per year in general aviation in the United States. And uh, some of them are more than just one occupant of the airplane. I think we froze on icing. <laughs> One of our uh, programs that we just came out with, the WeatherWise series, starts out with thunderstorms and goes on to air masses and fronts, and it'll be a several part series at, at uh, Air Safety Foundation that will be one of our online courses. Uh, thunderstorms and ATC, and that was really the thrust of what we've been talking about for the last two days with Bruce Landsberg is uh, how to get information, convective information from the controllers. But just the thumbnail sketch of it and the real short story on it is the controllers now have the ability to display weather. The controllers don't always give you weather that they see on their screen. I need to ask for it as a pilot, you need to ask for it as a pilot, uh, otherwise you're not going to get it. They can provide you vectors around it. Uh, I was talking to a guy that flew in here a couple of days ago and he said that there was about a 200 mile deviation to get in here. And he said that a lot of people were asking the controller, can you find me a way through it? Well, there just flat out wasn't a way through it. So the controller's not like Moses. He can't uh, clear a path for you through the, through the uh, weather, but at least he can tell you where it is in relation to where you are. Data link, if any of you are traveling with uh, some of the more capable handheld units that show the information, just be aware that that information is up to 11 minutes old at times. It's not the very latest uh, in information as if you had onboard radar. So be aware of the limitations of what you have. If you're going to be skirting a cell, which I don't recommend just based on your handheld display, um, you wouldn't want to skirt too close to it because what you're seeing on your handheld may not be uh, right up close. Some more of our uh, product that we have at the Air Safety Foundation that comes on to, to help you with this. We have safety advisors and, uh, and more online courses. Let's take a look at a VFR and IMC experience. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported five mile visibility looks more like two and you can't judge the height of the overcast. Your altimeter says you're at 1500 feet. 
but your chart tells you there's terrain in the area as high as 1,200 feet. Still, you've flown through weather like this before, so you press on. You find yourself easing back slightly on the controls to give yourself more clearance. Then, with no warning, you're in the soup. You peer so hard into the mist that your eyes hurt. You swallow, only to find your mouth dry. Somewhere, a voice is saying, you should have turned back. You now have 178 seconds to live. You push the rudder and add a little pressure on the controls to stop the turn. But this feels unnatural, and you return the controls to their original position. This feels better, but now your compass is turning a little faster, and your airspeed is increasing. You scan the panel for help, but you don't find any. It doesn't make any sense. You're sure you'll break out in a few minutes, but you don't have a few minutes. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and are shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1,200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The tack is in the red, and the airspeed's almost there too. You now have 45 seconds to live. Now you're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves the airspeed deeper into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the airplane. You have 10 seconds to live. Then you see the ground. The trees rush up at you. You can see the horizon if you turn your head far enough. But it's at a strange angle. CFIs, please. Create reali realistic scenarios for your students uh, as far as a 180 degree turn is, is concerned. Obviously, uh, real, don't be so realistic that we're going into the clouds and doing it without an IFR flight plan. But it's really not a bad idea to expose students because we still have an alarming number of these accidents happening, not just in the high weather areas in the uh, northern U.S. in the wintertime or the Pacific Northwest year round, but these accidents are happening all over the country uh, with alarming regularity and it's something that really hasn't changed. Why do we do it? I guess uh, all the reasons that we talked about before. Um, we think it won't happen to us, or we think if we press on a little bit in the soup that we'll get out of the clouds. But uh, if you aren't instrument rated, make a point of getting instrument rated and staying very current. Like I said, six month uh, instrument proficiency checks. And you can practice a, a 180 degree turn under the hood. You don't need your instructor for that. You can have a, a safety pilot with you. Uh, to see how your performance is doing, 180 degree turn under the hood. But of all the things, just fly the airplane first, keep the airplane stable. If you have an airplane with an autopilot, make sure you know how to use it. Turn it on in a hurry and use the heading uh, select function of it and use the altitude hold function of it. As far as off airport landings are concerned, there's a lot of debate on this. I, I see them happening uh, not as often as they should. And it always bothers me a little bit when I, I hear someone criticize a pilot for making an off-airport landing, but I really can't join in that criticism of a pilot because I don't know what situation has arisen that that pilot has chosen to make an off-airport landing. The insurance companies, trust me, would rather pay to have that airplane taken apart and hauled out on a truck than they would pay for uh, the pieces to be hauled out in the back of a truck. So if you have to make a precautionary landing, uh, it's your decision to make. Most are survivable. Ice, we talked about that just a little bit more before. Um, all the things that can happen with ice, um, most of the airplanes that we fly are equipped with uh, the only de-icing equipment they have and anti-icing equipped is just a heated pitot tube and that's really not enough uh, when we're flying in ice. We instituted a program, a test with the FAA at the Air Safety Foundation. It just concluded last Monday and what we wanted to do was get as many pilot reports into the system as we could. So we coordinated with, the, with uh, just one center. We went out to Seattle and coordinated with the Seattle Center controllers. And we had them ask the pilots. Anyone's flown in Seattle's airspace? Weather's not, not real good uh, in the wintertime, especially this time of year. So a 90-day test ran from January to April, January 7th to April 7th, where the controllers would ask the pilots for pilot reports and then go ahead and enter them into the system. So if you check for PIREPs, out in Seattle's airspace, you might have known a, an obscenely large number of them because the controllers cooperated very nicely with us, as did the pilots. And 
if the program is successful, we're just in the process of tallying the data now, one of my chores next week when I get back. But if the program is successful, we want to roll it out countrywide and uh, have the controllers be a little more involved in soliciting pilot reports, not just for ICE, but for con unforecast uh, IFR conditions, just so we can get the word out there. Because a forecast is absolutely useless to us if we are getting a forecast of terrible weather and we get out there and it's severe clear. If we don't tell somebody back at, the, uh, at ATC or flight service that the weather was not as forecast, then the next pilot along really doesn't have any idea of what's going on. But the thing with ice is, and I, I like to pre be, keep simple on ice because there's no real way to fly ice. We just need to keep out of ice and avoid ice in our small airplanes. But at one point during the flight, you were ice free, something to remember. So make that 180 degree, degree turn and get back to that ice free place uh, while well, you still can, while well, your airplane is still flying. I hear people talking about, well, my airplane holds a lot of ice and uh, other airplanes with a clean wing don't hold a lot of ice. Um, that's an area that uh, I think I've probably been guilty of saying the same thing too, but uh, that's really an area that we shouldn't be exploring. Uh, we'll leave that to the aeronautical engineers and the test pilot, how much ice the airplane will hold. So remember where you were not getting ice and go back there. If the last place where you're not getting ice was in your hangar, I really can't help you with that but uh, something to think about with ice. A decrease in speed is something that uh, is probably going to be the first thing you notice if you can't see your wings, but most of us fly airplanes where we can see our wings. But the problem is, in IMC, north of, uh, north of about here, your airplane is really not usable for a good portion of the year. Now we're moving on to fuel. Like I said before, we, we uh, averaged these out over a, a five-year period. And uh, when we got to the, the fifth and final category, fuel management, I, I will say a little bit of a disclaimer. After four, we got to uh, uh, what the NTSB accounts as uh, just throwing everything into the bin, all the accidents they can't really account for, uh, cause unknown. But we got to looking, and there was a lot of little causes unknown, but then the fuel cropped up to be a, a pretty big one, as it turned out. And so with fuel management, it's important to understand the difference between fuel starvation and fuel exhaustion. Fuel exhaustion is we don't have any air, uh, fuel left on the airplane. The only fuel left is down in the pumps, and that's a long ways away from us. Fuel starvation, of course, is there's airplane uh, fuel still in the airplane, but we have forgotten or temporarily forgotten or never knew how to get that airplane from where it is in the airplane to the engine that needs it. So starvation and exhaustion. This is a, a tough program to educate on because none of you are going to run out of fuel. If I asked each of you uh, if you were going to run out of fuel in the next week, none of you would. And I'm not going to run out of fuel. I can guarantee you that. But three people are going to run out of fuel, between two and three people, in the next week in the United States and the airplane is going to end up uh, somewhere where it wasn't intending to end up. Now, some of these end up fatal. Many of them don't end up fatal because the uh, airplane ends up at an airport or ends up undamaged on the ground, and these don't make it into the record. But um, it's, it's been a tough and monumental task for us to get the word out on fuel. We've put together a few little uh, pilot safety announcements, and I'd like to share them with you because we're, uh, we're playing them at just about all of our seminars that we have in, uh, in the country. Come with me on this one. Well, greetings from the flight deck, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Looks like our flight time to Hawaii will be about five hours and 20 minutes, uh, give or take. We're trying to save a little gas by keeping the fuel load pretty light today. So uh, just a heads up not to panic if you hear the engine shut down a little later in the flight since we might have to glide that last little bit into Honolulu. Not to worry though, we almost always make it, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Did I get the point across? <laughs> I wouldn't want to fly on them either. It's a good thing they went out of business first. <clears throat> But you know, the airlines uh, are, are very, very careful about that. Um, just, just as an example, uh, to an island like Bermuda, where there's no alternate airports near Bermuda, an airplane that leaves New York for Bermuda is fueled to get from New York to Bermuda 
and back to New York or back to Washington or back to an airport on the mainland that has legal alternate minimums. So something to think about. And with fuel and filing for an alternate, when we get into the intricities in Part 91, when alternates are required, I'm not going to cite the uh, 2,000 feet above and three miles visibility and within an hour before, an hour after, because I always get it mixed up unless I have the regs in front of me. But think of other things besides weather that can affect a diversion. Uh, if it's a single runway airport, a disabled aircraft on the runway uh, can cause a diversion. Um, I went back through my logbook when we started talking about fuel diversions and realized that of the 13 diversions I've had in my entire career and my entire flying life, big airplanes and little airplanes, only three of the 13 diversions were caused for weather. Let me tell you about some of the other things. Uh, short final to uh, Guadalajara, an earthquake. <laughs> and the tower said go around. And, and with the language difference, I couldn't understand why we needed to go around. But I had no idea there was an earthquake going on. Uh, they had to ascertain that the runway wasn't crashed, uh, cracked. Um, going into Caracas, Venezuela, 1989, civil unrest. And uh, rioters had lined the runway with tires and lit them all on fire. Um, um, not Bermuda, but uh, Barbados, uh, an airplane, a 747 broken axle on the runway and disabled the only runway. So we had enough uh, f fuel to get in for the weather we had, but yet on all these, and that's just a small example, on all these diversions, we legally didn't have to have fuel for a weather diversion since the weather was good, but yet we had to make a diversion anyway. Just something to think about. Let's look more a little bit uh, at fuel. One more PSA that we have, pilot safety announcement. We all know that dependence on foreign oil is a problem, and a lot of us are doing something about it. We've cut our energy consumption and traded our gas guzzlers for hybrid cars. But isn't there more we could be doing? All across the country, pilots are joining the fight to end our addiction to foreign oil. They're carrying just enough fuel to get within gliding range of their destinations. Some are even conserving by walking those last few miles. After all, why waste fuel when your airplane can glide to the ground using gravity and the power of the wind? Hybrid power. It's not just for cars anymore. Okay, since I'm not going to run out of fuel in the next week and you're all not going to run out of fuel in the next week, let's get the word out to our pilot friends uh, that uh, this is the, probably the easiest avoidable accident uh, that happens. But is it really so dumb? Think of the ways that you can get lured into running out of fuel. Your flight planning uh, from, let's say, uh, here to... Uh, back up to the mid-Atlantic states where, where I'll be heading when this is all over. On a good day, uh, and, and I make this flight a fair amount in a little airplane, on a good day I can just barely make it with an hour of fuel all the way there. And when I'm getting uh, high winds, headwinds that are undesirable, last time I did it was in a Piper Seneca, the headwinds that were undesirable, I um, could make it with maybe 45 minutes worth of fuel. And uh, I didn't want to become a statistic that I would have to read about later or somebody would have to read about later. So I was thinking about that and I thought, you know what, it would be really stupid to f uh, stop just 30 miles from my destination to buy fuel because that's breaking up the trip wrong. So I thought, why even pressure myself? Why not just plan a fuel stop in Hilton Head and uh, then I don't have to worry about do I have enough fuel for those last uh, couple of miles. So don't put yourself under the pressure. But it is important to know your fuel system. Um, a friend of mine has a 1959 uh, Beechcraft Bonanza, fine airplane, but uh, it requires what I think would be a PhD just to learn that fuel system. It seems a little complicated to me, but uh, I come from the country myself. But if you don't know your fuel system exactly, you don't know how to get that fuel to the air, uh, engine when it needs it, then you are setting yourself up for a starvation accident. Another thing too, uh, and this has happened three times in the last 12 months, a pilot realized he needed fuel. He made the right decision, he landed, and for one reason or another, there was a high fee for a late night call out after hours. Fuel was not available because they had the wrong nozzle, wrong pump, wrong grade, or just flat out nobody there at the airport. Um, so in these three cases, the pilot took back off again after stopping for fuel and experienced uh, fuel exhaustion. 
And that seems to be one of the most avoidable ones that there is. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the top five accident causes, uh, averaged out over five years. These are where the problem areas are happening. But it's all about aeronautical decision making. Always be thinking. The pilot needs to be the worst pessimist or the best pessimist ever. Uh, as you're rolling down the runway, you say, do I have enough runway? As you're climbing to altitude, is this a good altitude where I can glide somewhere if I need to? Uh, as we're monitoring our fuel load, we need to be thinking, do we have enough fuel to do what we want to do when we get to our destination? Our destination is closed and we have to go somewhere else. Be pessimistic. And just a couple of simple rules. And this is getting back to the concept of uh, personal minimums that we talked about earlier. Just a few things we can do to mitigate the risk of general aviation. Keep the buzzing to a minimum, or not at all. Have enough fuel in at least an hour. And don't rely on your airplane to uh, have that heated pitot tube de-ice the whole wings. It's not going to work. And in a short runway, less than 2,500 feet, take care. A good friend of mine flies a, a Piper Cheyenne, and he's a fairly low time pilot for a Piper Cheyenne, but uh, he doesn't like to do approaches less than 1,000 foot ceilings and three miles visibility. He'll fly at IFR until he gets some more hours. He said that's what he was going to do. He set personal minimums. He doesn't give the devil on his shoulder a chance to uh, put input into the flying situation. But take a look at these. Of the 1,142 pilot related fatal accidents, minus ones in that category, we would have had only 230 fatalities. It's a big number. And that's the job for us. Appreciate you all coming to this seminar. You know, it's a pleasure that in all the uh, professions and uh, hobbies, I don't see a lot of scuba divers coming together in great numbers to, to come to safety meetings, but I love doing pilot safety meetings because uh, you all actually care about your safety, the safety of those that fly with you, and the safety of those around you. And I appreciate your attention to some of these things that are uh, big items out there for us general aviation pilots. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you JJ. That was pretty interesting. There, right? there we go. Yeah. Right. Have you got any questions for him? Bring a, come up here and talk with JJ. If you're interested in the uh, Null report, I have, like I said, I shipped 106 pounds of them down here the other day, and they're all in the back of the room back there, so take one with you. If you filled out your registration form, drop it off in the AOPA tent and fill out the form, too, to enter our daily drawing for a prize. I'm not sure what it is today. There's places in the AOPA tent to put both of those. Yes, it does, and if you fill out that registration form, we send you the form, and you can negotiate your wings credit on the basis of that form that certifies you were here. There's a registration form back there on that back table. Drop it off in the AOPA tent. Well, they gave you the 15 minutes, though. Yeah, I know. Still lots of time. No, I know. I know. Thank you.